Good morning, Vietnam. Good morning to all of you. Good evening to any of you that are at night somewhere, maybe America. <laughs> it is a uh, Sunday morning for us and we welcome you all to this beautiful, I wish I actually could say this was a backdrop. It's not a backdrop. This is actually the house that the house sitting. So welcome to you all. Our first live stream of 2022. Um, we have lots to tell you. We have lots of questions to answer and so yeah welcome yeah absolutely welcome everyone so um let's say some hellos first of all so everyone you know say hello and tell us where you're watching us from um so just hi to uh cruising holiday and uh stuart hello stuart um nick russell 1 p.m east coast australia so yeah it's uh Sunday, what day are we? Sunday lunch in Australia and like Saturday evening in the US, That's I think. the joy of having a, a global following. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Stephen, hello from Adelaide, uh, my hometown. Dad? No, that's a different one. Um, Tim, David, Dan, wow, there's so many. Um, Dave, Stuart, Anyway, if, James, we've missed, if we've missed out on you, it's um, apologies, we'll get back to you again. Valerie from Mexico. Valerie from Mexico. I knew it was called Valerie from Mexico. Anyway, it's another story. Doug. So listen, um, we are happily ensconced in Ho Chi Minh City, otherwise known as Saigon. We have been here for a couple of weeks now. Um, just to get you into the timeline, I think we, we, although we've been here for two weeks, we had to do three mandatory days of quarantine, which was great. And then we got out of quarantine the day that Tet started, the Tet holiday started. For those of you who are not in the know, Tet runs... Although the, the actual celebrations are about three or four days, for most places in Vietnam, everything closes for 16 days. So it's like two weekends and, and then two weeks in between. So everything, everything has closed, um, which for us has been in some ways a massive blessing um, because we've managed to get used to driving around Ho Chi Minh on a motorbike <laughs> without all the insanity that goes with that. I mean, there's still plenty of that insanity. But yeah, so, but there is very much a lot of insanity. Yeah. But um, the way that these, the, that these uh, live feeds work is if you have questions, just ask them to type them in down below. We've just come from the Patreon live feed where we can ask and answer questions in more depth. But, if we don't answer your question straight away, just keep typing them because they, they scroll up so quickly. Yeah, give us like 10 minutes um, <clears throat> because we're usually a bit behind. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, if after 10 minutes yeah, question hasn't been answered, then just type it again. Yeah, and a couple of things because I know we've mentioned this all the time. If you haven't, could you please like this, just click, hit the like button if you're able to. I know that you can't always do so with televisions, but if you hit the like, it's good for us. I can see there's a couple of our patrons who've um, come over from the Patreon. Yeah, like, yeah, we haven't had nothing in the last hour, you're rabbiting on. So um, question, any questions that you want to ask, please ask and we will answer. I am going to try and clear one thing up, though, because we've got this quite a lot, and it's about the video that we put out last week um, to, to you all about holes one, two, and three. Now, this is a series of videos that, you know, we've already filmed. But we've had a few of you naysayers, obviously some of those of you who are probably less enthused with life at the moment, uh, are like, oh, the factory's empty. There's clearly nothing going on there. Some clever chap is always like, see, we've clearly gone bust. That's why there's no boats there. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, we got out of quarantine on, I think, Friday, two weeks ago. As Ho Chi Minh shut for Tet, so that was Friday, um, we then kind of said to Shane, the, the, the general manager at Seawind, like, okay. The marketing manager. Marketing manager, yeah. He's like, look, I'll open the factory on Saturday for you, but bear in mind, we only acquired this factory um, about a month ago, and we moved the boats in about three days ago. So that, um, they literally took the boats in at night. Ho Chi Minh is just an, ins for traffic, it is insane. So they moved the boats at night, they brought everything in, to the factory and then just said, oh, we're closing for Tet. So there was nothing, there's nothing in the factory at all. I can promise you that the other factory is just booming. We went in on the Saturday after we saw the three holes and we've got an episode about that coming up, about other aspects of the build of Ruby Rose too, but they're all working over time. So, you know, can I just say, who's that? Jay Jason. Jason. Thank you, Jason. With thank a you. you are amazing GIF. Is it GIF or GIF? I think it's GIF. 
I'll show you again. <laughs> um, graphic information files. So I think the G is G. G. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm so very behind. Anyway, on. so the factory, uh, it will open up on, actually not tomorrow. It opens up on Tuesday. Tech yeah. finishes officially uh, and the holiday finishes on Monday night. So Tuesday, it will all be all be back and running and they will move everything in. I mean, they had a, that factory. The factory is not a new building, but they acquired a factory and they've had to build like a crazy amount of stuff. Like, they have had to build a launch ramp. It's it runs next to a the factory runs next to a, 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 like a, a canal, creek, a canal river, which is tidal. A tidal, and yeah. they, but they've had to build this huge kind of concrete launch ramp, which like must have cost. I mean, did Shane told us it cost an absolute arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. So that they've they've had to kind of build a lot of infrastructure in to kind of get everything up and running but it will be um, yeah once it's all up and running it will be really good and what they obviously are doing all this for is to scale up the production of the 1370s because there are bloody loads on order um i think someone asked how many have actually sold i believe we've we're up to 80 83 well, see, are up to 84 hulls yeah. we've got um hull, hull owner 83 or hull 83 owner here um greg um so yeah i think i think there's one or two after you greg um but we're obviously hull number two and hull number one um, is about four weeks ahead of ours in terms of production and hull number three has... Um, is being infused as we speak. So that's... Probably not as yeah. we speak, but this no, no, week. As we speak, this week, it'll be, this this, week. They will start that yeah. process. So look, it, it is all moving really fast and there's a lot of things that we've seen that we're like, okay, that we had not seen. I mean, it's been great and sea winds, I mean, obviously global pandemic aside, we have had to do all our filming remotely um, using um, staff at Seawind and they've done an absolute sterling job. So thank you to them. Um, we, there was obviously things that we, if you can film yourself, you can make, you can obviously make, uh, you, you, you get to sh see bits that, you know, are more important to you. So being able to get to the factory and have a look at certain things has been really important to us. A couple of things that we mentioned on the Patreon feed, we went out yesterday and I bought a tape measure. And the reason I bought a tape measure is because I want to really, in diving into these nerdy details, I want to be able to say to you, yes, this locket is, these are the dimensions. And, you know, this is the, these these are the standing heights and this is the bed length. So there's going to be a lot over the next six months, five months, there is going to be a lot of like really nerdy information that we are going to back up with data. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to some questions um, because we've got loads and loads of questions um, rolling in. So we're going to try and I'm not going to lie and say we're going to get to all of them because we won't be able to do that. Um, and a lot of them we probably just answer in, in general kind of chit-chat anyway. Um, but, yeah, any questions that you have, um, please ask us now and we will do our best to answer them. So um, just a very easy one. Um, are you in touch with the winds? Yes, definitely. Um, we spoke to Nikki and Jason not too long ago. They're lovely. We've invited them to come sailing with us when Ruby Rose 2 is built. Um, hopefully they take us up on that. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, we're, we're good friends with Nikki and Jason. And then we've also invited them to our wedding, haven't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're invited to our wedding as well. Um, as are you all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> um, okay. So... <laughs> So, um, yeah, lots of questions about when Ruby Rose 2 will be completed. Um, we've been told May. Um, we're hope, hoping May. Yeah. We've been told May. So we're... we're they we're said May, May, it's going to be May. Yeah. Um, Henry asks, are we renting a motorbike? Yeah, we are. We're renting a scooter. Uh, we can't, because we don't have a VW's licence, we can't rent anything too intensive, but we've got a 49cc... 49 cc, 49 whole cc's. That has got the, that's essentially the capacity of this cup <laughs> in, in engine so size. So go scooting around with the two yeah, of us. But no, but that's the only, the only uh, motorbike that you can legally um, ride without a Vietnamese driving license. Although many, many people do ride illegally. Um, I'm too much of a square to uh, to not do that. And I kind of, I don't want to get into the whole being stopped by police and getting fined. I think that the main issue is that it's not so much if you get stopped by the police, but... Um, if you have an accident. If you have an accident, then your health insurance, if you end up in the hospital, your health insurance probably doesn't cover you if yeah. you're riding without a license. Yeah, that's exactly And that, that could be an expensive mistake. Exactly so, this. Exactly. Um, Jason, uh, do you have a timeline of how long you'll be there in Vietnam? Uh, will we... 
uh, leave before the boat is finished. So our visas run out mid-April, but we have been told that we can extend them. So we're yet to do that, but apparently we can. Um, we have every intention of being here right up until the oh, completion absolutely. of and, and one thing that may happen is that we may actually sail the boat away from Vietnam. Yeah, um, so there's another question. What are we going to do? So let's we don't know. now. And we don't know. And who, who is that? Who's this? Um, who is this? Who is this person? Stuart. Oh, Stuart. Hey, Stuart. Thank you. Hello. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Um, the question that we get asked a lot, Mon, is like, what are you doing regarding taking delivery? Where are you going to take delivery? At the moment, we don't know. There is one thing that I do really want to do is get that boat across an ocean. I want it. That's what she's designed for. So I don't want to be pootling around between harbors. Um, I want to get her out and stre get her to stretch her legs. Again, with everything going on that's happened with COVID and shipping being out of place and shipping costs being astronomically high, we don't know what we're going to do. So we have multiple options that we will explore nearer the time. And the reason we're not, we're not obviously, you know, this, there's no kind of like um, intrigue that we're creating here. <laughs> we just are not going to know until pretty near, you know, near to launch date, what the cost of shipping is and whether or not we are willing to take that cost. Yeah. Um, um, I think like in non-COVID times, we would be kind of, we'd have a much clearer idea because they'd probably be, I said, look, the shipping cost will be around X. But as anyone knows, um, watching this, shipping has just been like really expensive, like shipping anything um, has been really expensive. Um, so... Yeah, so we don't know. We're hoping the costs come down. So ideally, ideally, we want to get the boat across the Atlantic um, at the end of this year, the beginning of 23, to be in the Caribbean for 23, to get like, and then we're going to, that's when we'll start doing meetups and things like that. So the idea is that we kind of get to show you the boat in person and we'll get all that done. And all that information will be out there. So, you know, we have kind of, I guess designing it as a collective is actually the wrong expression, but we have had so much help from a lot of, you know, you guys that, you know, of course we want to catch up with you. So that will all be done. And yeah, someone asked whether we're coming to Annapolis this year. I don't think so because we would have like taken delivery of Ripper. Never to, say never. Um, well, it will become, it will come smack bang in the middle of our sailing, like our first sailing mm. season. And um, we don't know where that will be yet. It might be in the U S it might be in a, Europe, it might be here in Asia. Um, obviously, you know, we have to wait and see. But, but if we're with it, if we, if, yeah. If we can, we will. Yeah. I don't know if we can. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the whole thing about Annapolis is great. It is, and I love, I do love Annapolis. I love, the whole experience is, is fantastic. Um, I don't think we'll be there with Ruby Rose too. I just think it's it's just, it, it, geographically, it's a very difficult position to be in, to put a boat up there and then we get to the Bahamas and do something. Yeah, we so, won't be able to be so there. So I don't think the boat will be there, but we will be there. But if the We may be there. We, yeah, but if the boat, wherever we are, wherever the boat is, we will be doing events where you can come and see the boat. The love is coming in thick and fast. Thank you so much. Um, John Davis, thank you. Jason and um, Carmen Cloud. Um, Carmen says, sorry, I missed Patreon feed. Congratulations. Would love to know how you're enjoying the area. Um, so can I just say if we ever have a like a I think Carmen Cloud is a lovely name if we ever have a what a cat I was gonna say cat. <laughs> I was gonna say daughter but then I kind of like my testicles <laughs> shrunk to the size of raisins and I thought no reverse reverse how can I get out of this and not use the word anyway nice name Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> okay um that is a lovely name uh now let's answer her question yes what was my choice <laughs> Would love to know how you're enjoying the area. We, yeah, we, we talked about this a lot on our Patreon feed just now. We, like, adore Ho Chi Minh. I Skyped to my sister and my niece yesterday um, and my brother-in-law and, you know, they were like, oh, how's Vietnam? You know, just asking, like, the usual question. And I, I don't think they were expecting, like, 20 minutes of us, like, gushing about how much we love Ho Chi Minh. Like, I think, you know, their eyes started glazing over at the five-minute mark. Like, we literally, we love, I, I'm surprised at how much I am just loving being here. Yeah. Um, so we're in a place called Tao Dien, which yeah. is part of District 2. And it's kind of the centre of Ho Chi Minh. It's not It's not the, like the, the, the where not the like shops are. town centre. And it's kind of where the expats are, which when I first heard about it, I was kind of a bit off put by it. I'm like, oh, it's going to be lots of expats like drinking beer. and that. But it's not. It's, it's pretty... It's only, it's not that westernized, um, but you can get good coffee. And yesterday I managed to find Marmite and things like that, which mm -hmm. is, you know, for a, you know, I guess I'm turning into an expat, but, <laughs> uh, but it's lovely. It's everyone so is nice. super, the things we've traveled in Asia extensively, a couple of things that 
have been patently clear to us. In other Asian countries, everyone tries to rip you off but overtly. Um, here, there's prices on everything. Sometimes. Sometimes. Not no, but, you know, but Thailand, you know. If like, you're in a touristy place. Yeah. So they, they are, and everyone's super friendly. It's ridiculously cheap. Yeah. Like here, honestly, like lunch is like 50 cents. A beer is a dollar. And I think that we've just, like what we've found is that like all the, you know, kind of, Ho Chi Minh residents, the, you know, everyone here is just so kind and cheerful and hardworking and, like, honest. I don't want to say honest in a way that means that, like, I was expecting otherwise, but they're just, they're so, like, just, they're, they're just here to do their jobs and get on with their jobs. And, you know, I, like, made a mistake the other day. I, I thought I paid with something by um I was meant to be paying with cash and I had already paid by card. So I try, I was trying to give cash over to this guy who couldn't speak any English and he was trying to tell me that I'd already paid by card, but I didn't realise I'm trying to give him some cash. And he literally, like, you know, there's a lot of countries that we've travelled to that they would have been like, oh, okay. Mm, extra cash. I mean, in Australia, <laughs> in the UK, oh, America. You're, oh, yeah, mate, thanks for the tip. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just take that 20 bucks, thanks. Um, but, you know, it's just a really hardworking um, entrepreneurial, you know, culture, and yeah. we really like it. Here. Absolutely love it. Just a quick reminder for all of those of you watching this, like 800 of you, if you haven't already clicked the like button, just uh, click away. And if you've wandered into this, the other thing is, and honestly, this drives me mad, a lot of people are messaging us just saying, ah, oh, YouTube unsubscribe me from your channel. If you've unsubscribed it, that's fine because you're like, <laughs> I don't want to listen to you anymore. But just check to make sure that you have not been unsubscribed because we're getting that quite a lot. I'm not sure why and how that happens. There you go. Maybe YouTube's trying to like tell us something. Tell us something. Enough, enough with the build. Is that Sam? Sam, That's Sam. Sam and Sydney. Sam, thank you, you're so lovely. Thank you. Um, so questions, three. What do we? Well, what? Sam has another question, oh, tell us which is, um, how does it feel to finally walk the Hull of Rubros too? Don't care about the specs. Don't care about your experience. <clears throat> other than that, be amazing. Um. Uh, do you want to answer it first? And I'll answer oh, sorry. It. Don't care about the specs. Do you care about your experience? I was going to say, Sam, that, <laughs> what do you care about? Um, he, yeah, cares about the experience. Um, honestly, Sam, it was a surreal moment because it's something, you know, when you like are visualizing like in your mind something for so long and then when it happens, it doesn't, it feels like you're still just dreaming about it. That's kind of how it felt to me. I was like, this feels like I'm just walking in one of my daydreams again. Um, it was an amazing experience. We were very lucky to have Shane there to talk us through everything and to point everything out and to kind of once again um, kind of point to different aspects of the like design of the hull and the interior of the build, of course, but we haven't put that video out yet um, and kind of talk us through everything. I have never, we, you know, the only other boat that I've owned was Ruby Rose, um, I was suddenly 38 and I wasn't involved in the build process at all. I never went down to see the build. You know, I was like living my best life in London in my mid twenties at the time. I'm like, that sounds boring. I'd rather stay up in London and party with my friends. So I wasn't involved in that. So this is the first time I've ever like had this experience of, of watching the, the progress of a boat build, our boat build. And um, it's fascinating. It's amazing. And I just, there was so much that, you know, we were able to finally, you know, look at and say, you know what, that, that is going to be the thing that we've been trying to kind of achieve for so long. Like the workshop, you know, Nick's like standing in where the workshop is going to be. And it, like finally, you know, we can visualize it. Um, it's just going to be the most amazing boat, to be honest. And it, yeah. it just, it feels very surreal. And we just feel incredibly lucky that we are yeah. able to. We say this every day. Here. I mean, from my point of view, I think um, the whole experience was pretty, I mean, genuinely overwhelming. Um, I think from a point of view of when you were beginning to see the boat, and that's a lot to unpack from the point of view of, firstly, we've had a hand in designing like parts of this boat. I'm not talking about how the whole shape is or the rock or anything else, but there's so many features in this boat that we went to Seawind with back in 2019 and said, look, can you integrate this? Is this possible? And they said, yeah, 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 we can do all that. So that is one strand that we knew that we'd now start to see things that we, in some cases, blatantly stole from other boats. I'm not going to lie to you. Like the Maverick 440, 
like when I saw the Maverick 440 at the Annapolis in 2019, I'm like, we need this workshop. This is what I want. This is exactly what I want. I want this. I want storage. I want this. So, so and the, the exquisite as well. Like there were so many clever design features yeah. on the exquisite. And we're like, that's such a good idea. Like, we're stealing that. I mean, yeah. Well, we didn't say we were stealing it, but we're just like, that's brilliant. And then when Seawind said, you know, what is Let, the best? let's discuss, yeah. then, um, you know, we were like, well, we've actually got a lot of thoughts. Um, so that's one part of it. The fact that from, we know that there's a lot of this that is not, these aren't simply customization options. These are things that we have taken to Seawind and they are going to put into every boat. So that is like a real, for my point, a real point of personal pride. Genuinely, that's the first thing. So being able to see the physical hull is like, was like, okay, this is a real milestone in, in my life with this, uh, like an interest in boats from not just the perspective of, oh, I want to live on a boat, like from design and build. That's point one. Point two, like it is after COVID and two years and delays and the frustrations of travel, which have occurred to 8 billion people, notwithstanding, I'm not belittling like economic collapses and people, you know, families being ripped apart and people dying. But on this level, it like, to actually be able to get to somewhere where it's physically visit the boat was massively, it was really emotional that the, 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 it wasn't, it's not a staged reaction mm -hmm. that you see, like genuinely, um, I'm like, okay, this is a lot to process. And for me, the third part here, which again, we also were very mindful of trying to capture everything on film, which in itself is actually, it's not that easy to do because you're trying to, it's a bit like, I guess imagine, it's a bit like trying to film your own wedding. You're kind of, you've got to do, you've got to be, um, it, you've got to try and enjoy the moment, absorb the moment, but yet capture it all for you guys and girls and that's something that again you know <clears throat> if we hadn't we didn't have a youtube channel i literally would have been running around the boat screaming and like you know being a right diva about it because i was so excited but you know i've also got like group lieutenant <laughs> vandaloo next to me who clearly gave me a set of massive instructions to not stuff this up and, and to hold the camera straight like this is a one take situation <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes so yes yeah, so, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, there was a lot to and but when, when you're filming your own lives, like there's no take two. And um, uh, look, yeah. I, I'm not comparing us to anything that we ever see on Netflix or anywhere <laughs> else. But you know, when you whenever you look at the credits of any other anything else that in the credits roll, where was it? We was we were somewhere the other week, and like literally, the, we couldn't turn the credits off. We're waiting for the thing to come on next on the TV. We're watching the actual television. Oh, it was actually the actual yeah. television. That was it. Yes, of course. We were watching Vietnamese TV, and there was like some movie that we wanted to watch. It was Anchorman, actually. Oh yeah, that's right. It was Anchorman. Yeah, we Anchorman. watched Anchorman. That but was you that's can't hilarious. Stop, you know, back to anyway. you know, pre Netflix. You can't turn the credits off. You have to sit and watch them all. Yeah, and they're rolling for like. 30 minutes or 20 minutes. It takes a lot of people to make a movie. And there's just two of us. So, yeah. yeah, there's a lot to unpack and not stuff up. But overall, Sam, like, it was pretty powerful, a pretty powerful set of emotions that I am still processing. Do you know what? And this is a good thing about, um, yeah, filming. Filming. I guess if I say it takes away from the moment, but it, it distracts you from the moment because you can't multitask like multitasking i think is a myth like you there's no such thing as multitasking can you, you can you all play this back to her when she tells me that she can multitask if it's every night no no i never claim to be able to multitask yeah. because i think <laughs> that um you can only do one thing you can't do two things well you can only do two things badly so you can only ever focus on one thing so this is what i try and say to Nick sometimes um is Focus. it yeah if you're filming you have to just be filming you can't be filming as well as trying to do other stuff because otherwise you can't film so yeah um the beauty of filming it though is that you get to watch it back and you know obviously when we're doing the editing process we're watching it back yeah. and that's when I think I personally um really are able to appreciate what's happening it's, anyway there's a lot to take in and a lot to yeah. absorb and we're still absorbing it and yeah. every visit that we go we are as yeah. the bill progresses yeah it's, it's gonna, gonna get more, more it is exciting. gonna be yeah it's good yeah crazy exciting yeah. the nearest i can probably get to recreate that feeling you get around the beginning of december as a child waiting for christmas yeah yeah okay Next uh, question, let's Ella. get to okay let's try and we're going to go through lots of questions mm -hmm. everyone i've if you've already asked a question that we haven't answered, which we probably haven't, type it below and we're going to try and answer them all within reason. Like, 
30 second answers. Go on then, 30 okay. seconds. Let's try and actually answer questions because sometimes we, we, sometimes we get distracted and we go off on a tangent. Okay, Matt, I'm going to start with you. Where do you think Ruby Rose 2 will be able to take you that Ruby Rose 1 could not? I'll answer this. Um, Ruby Rose 1, our Southerly 38, could have taken us anywhere in the world, like literally anywhere in the world. The reason why we stopped our kind of planned circumnavigation and we decided to come back to Europe was because we realised after living on her for like three years at that point, four years maybe, that taking her into, for example, the Pacific, really remote, isolated cruising grounds um, was not really what she was built for because there was just not enough storage. We couldn't get her sailing fast enough, so we spent a lot of time at sea because she was 38-foot monohull. So we spent a lot of time at sea. You know, we had to provision for that. We couldn't fit a generator in, so, like, power was always um, limited. You know, we had a very low-output water maker for that reason so like everything on board was more difficult and Ruby Rose 2 everything on board will be so much easier because we are going to have a really fast boat we're going to have loads of storage we're going to have like plenty of electricity we're going to have a lot of um what are you smiling at just uh, for how, how 30 seconds seems to be uh blowing out massively <laughs> <laughs> my first I've fallen yeah. at the first hurdle Play, continue <laughs> And, um, yeah, she's just going to be amazing. So River Rose 1 could have gone anywhere, but we just were like, this is too hard. Um, River Rose 2 is going to be awesome. 30-second question. Brilliant. Sorry. Ne next 30 seconds. Okay. Um, oh, no. I'm... Next, okay. Ron, next trip to the Korean restaurant me. Thank you, mate. We need to find <clears> another Korean restaurant. If you've seen our Instagram stories, you'll know what he's talking about. Yeah, Instagram's like a bit nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, Korean Nick, restaurant. Yeah, Nick needs to work on his Vietnamese. He does, Nick, the work he's Vietnamese. How he dare you, Ron? Yeah, Nick does need to work on his Vietnamese. Um, how is their beer? There's uh, a lot of craft beer here. Yes, there is. Surprisingly. Yeah, there is. There is. A, there are a lot of breweries. I mean, look, Tiger, which is kind of like a, an Asian kind of mainstay, is it's about... 30 cents, a, 30 cents a bottle if you go to the right place. Um, it's, it's so cheap. It's just crazy. Um, I, I'm sorry. But the thing about drinking, it is hot here. It is hot and it's humid. And drinking craft beer when it's hot and it's humid, sometimes you just want something that's about 5% and ice cold. Uh, yeah. And we try We Yeah, we prefer the, the Tiger or the Saigon beers. I think, is Tiger um, Vietnamese? I thought it was, no, it's not. It was Singaporean, I think. Um, I'm not sure. Go. Anyway, um, okay. Let's try again with the 30-second answers. Go. I'll answer this one. You, you'll answer this one. Okay. What changes came from you sailing the 1260? Um, uh, carbon coach roof. I think that was one thing. Reducing the weight at the yep. stern. Definitely one thing. Definitely moving to lithium batteries. Definitely moving to dual helm controls. Um, those were definites. I think that's under yep. 30 seconds. Yes. Next. Um, based on your conversation with the owner of Seawind, would you tell a first-time sailing family to choose a catamaran as their first boat? I don't see why not. If you're a sailing family, so not just the two of you, mm. I would. I young children, yeah, I think <clears throat> a catamaran is a good option. I think that the question needs to be split into two parts or the refined. I think if it's your first boat, like you've never owned a boat before, then no. That's just my way of looking at things. If it's your first boat for a long trip or for a liverboard, or for time where you want to spend a lot of time at anchor, then yes. So I think that the, the question is slightly nuanced. I do. If you're learning to sail, if you're like starting off, yeah. never sailed a boat before, never owned a boat before, a catamaran is, you know. Look, but. but lots of people do it. Nicky and Jason. Nicky and Jason did yeah. it. I think it depends a lot on your attitude as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next. So that's. That's not, that's not 30 seconds. I know. That wasn't a very good answer either. Let's just try 30 seconds. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so this, yeah. Oh God! Now I've lost the questions. How um, how have your expectations been so far? As in, have our ha, have our expectations been met so far? Met and exceeded. Met, yeah. Met for sure. like and no no BS no BS there. Literally, look, seeing this boat, it is. And um, for those non patrons, um, you'll get this video next week. It is the inside. The this internal week. volume of that is huge. It is absolutely huge. Um, so it's bigger than we thought it would be. It's sleeker than it's I thought huge. it would be. It is, it is sleeker. Yeah. It, and whole profile is much. And then a lot of the stuff that we've done with design, that succeeded our expectations. One thing that was um, has been a revelation is that if you watch us on Instagram or follow us on Facebook, I went to Hanoi with Shane 
um, last week to just look at stainless steel manufacture, which sounds like super boring. And I guess if you're not into stainless steel, you're like, oh, that is super boring. But to me, it wasn't because we lent to chat to the guy who runs this stainless steel factory and just the quality of the stuff that comes out there, out there is like insanely good. And I made a video, we've made a video about it, but I kind of guess that, and I never thought this, like between like the worst stainless steel you can buy and the best, there is a huge, a huge scale. Um, not just in the quality of the actual material science in the composition of the, of, of the materials, but also in how welds are polished, how they acid etch uh, leached materials from the stainless steel before polishing it. it. There's a whole process that I was completely unaware of. And we're going to try and bring this to you. I think one thing that, yeah, so that we're going to try and bring this to you. There's my 30 seconds. Another 30 seconds. <laughs> it's, in, it's in blocks of 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jonathan, so I know someone has asked this question, but what is the plans for your first trip? Okay, so we um, don't know. That's the short answer. Uh, the reason why we don't know is because we had always had this idea and we still have this kind of this firm vision of us starting our Rubro's to adventures from Europe. And, you know, that's come about because that was where we sold Rubro's one. Um, and we kind of just wanted to pick up where we left off and start in Europe and ideally in you know ideal world maybe do a circumnavigation or at the very least sail to Australia over the course of a few years. Obviously, we're b building the boat in Vietnam, <clears throat> so that's not so easy. We had always thought we would ship the boat to Europe, which most um, seaweed owners do. They ship the boat from Vietnam to either wherever it is that they're from, Europe, the US, Australia, wherever. But shipping costs, as everyone knows, are astronomical right now, and so that might be cost prohibitive. Um, the other issue, um, on the other hand, uh, insurance costs for Asia are, like, insane. So to insure our boat here, if we were to take delivery here and cruise around Asia, like, the insurance costs would be phenomenal. So we need to kind of cost it out and um, come up with a bit of a plan. We're not going to know the shipping costs until, like, maybe four weeks before the the, the the boat is completed. So we don't know. So we don't know. We're not going to know until like very close to the boat actually being. But option one is option one for us is at the moment um, ship to Europe and sail across the Atlantic at Christmas. Yeah, that would be our ideal. That's our honeymoon. Our honeymoon is going to be an Atlantic crossing in 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 Plan A. How romantic! I can just see you coming into the doorway wearing your oil skins, saying. Darling, darling, it's time. Darling, darling, it's time you're on watch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, okay. So uh, have there been any major changes from the original design? Um, some minor ones. Nothing, yeah, nothing major. major. I think just minor ones. <clears throat> like the workshop, that was um, something that There was... were a few different designs that they put across. I think that they've, they've settled on one now, and it's the one that I think works better for us. Um and just to talk about the workshop, you know, we'll talk about that in depth. I've always thought that, I felt that from working on a Ruby Rose um, extensively over the nine years of our ownership, you have to be seated. You, there's no point in having a standing workshop. You need fine motor control. Mm. I agree. 30 uh, seconds, yeah? 30 seconds. Yes. Uh, Darren, hi, guys. Hi from New Zealand. I um, was going to ask, who did you go through to sale? S-A-L-E. Um as in, who did we go through to buy Rubro's to? We went through Jay Nolan, who is European yeah. man marketing manager. Yeah. So if, yeah. If you, by the way, if anyone does want to buy a Sea Wind, I, I'm not. Sure, I think you know. Um, yeah. You buy. Uh, just drop us a D DM us, and then we can pass you uh, details. Because a lot of people are like, "Oh, how do I can't?" That? We get this question a lot. Just we we can answer that pretty easily. Next. Next. Um, very quickly. Thank you to JPW. That's very generous. Nice, thank thank you. you, mate. Um, okay, a question. Is an SSB a worthy investment today or just go satellite? Ooh, I, I actually, if you'd asked me this three years ago, I would have said it's a worthy investment. Now I'm not so sure. Yeah. I really am not so sure. I think satellite costs are coming down. I think we're in a transition between SSB being made redundant and um, Starlink becoming readily available for marine use within about three years. So I think that by the time, I mean, you know, the 1370s up to like Hull 83, by the time Hull 83 is produced, you know, it's likely there'll be a viable Starlink option. Yeah. I mean, we're not getting an SSB, put it that way. No, we're not. Um, 
would you consider from Roger, would you consider any other manufacturer than Seawind yes. and why? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But, you know, we're not tied to, you know, never mentioning other brands. I would happily sell with Uchimair. I'd happily sell with Exquisite. Um, two I, very different boats. Two, yeah, different two very different boats. And absolutely that. And this is, you know, the longer I spend doing this whole sailing malarkey, the more I realize that there are, in, in whether in catamarans or monohulls, there are there is a boat for the job. And there is nothing that, there's nothing that fulfills all criteria in the same way that I'm never going to try and argue that catamarans are, are the best for every job. You know, high latitude sailing. I wouldn't want a catamaran. I'd want like a, you know, something, a monohull. But yeah, so there are other brands we would definitely <clears throat> consider. I think this whole um, journey for us and taking you lot along is to try and, educate is the wrong word because it sounds patronizing, but to try and inform you of like what happens when you scratch the surface and look to manufacturing methods, to the material science of not just infusion, but technology. So this whole kind of experience for us and what we're trying to show you is do your research and see how it's built, see how, see the thought process that goes into it and then, you know, and then make your decision, whatever you buy. But, you know, we and we've done all this with the, with the, the whole series we did with Antoine a couple of years ago, you know, material science, you know, between vinyl ester and polyester, which is essentially what your two uh, materials are, and epoxy when it comes to whole design and whole material, there's a gulf between the two. And, you know, you would want vinyl ester. You always will want vinyl ester as a minimum because of its impervience to osmosis. But so many catamarans are made of polyester. But again, the whole thing about this is when you go to look at the catamaran, will the broker know and will the broker tell you what the material is? But that's really, really important. It's super important. Like, you know, for instance, um, you know, my father's Italian, so, you know, I, I'm allowed to say this. I wouldn't, if I wanted to buy a classic car, I'd never buy a classic Italian car because it will rust. <laughs> because, because the problem is that they're all made of really low-grade mild steel and they fall apart, which is why you can't buy an Alfa Romeo from the 1970s or 80s because they just don't really exist anymore because they all fall apart. People accept and understand that in, in the automotive industry that cars are different and, you know, they have different reliability levels. With boats, the assumption tends to be that they are all the same and they're not. Yeah. Okay. So Michelle um, says, have you ever thought of going to colder areas like Alaska or Norway or come on over to Florida and go up the coast? Love you both. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, I love the cold. I love being cold. I don't know why. Because um, you're Dutch. Yeah. Um, but uh, Nick hates it. Nick like literally complains incessantly whenever he's like a little bit cold. So he has made it very clear that his position on high latitude sailing is yeah, I, firm. I can't help it. So I, just, I really he's not keen. I think when the temperature drops below about eighty, um, I'm I'm done. But I would love to sail Norway. I would. I mean, I would bloody love to sail Norway and Alaska and. I'd love to sell like um, the Baltic and um, yeah, it would, I just think that that would be so, so cool. So never say never. I'll keep trying to convince him, but you know, like we, I don't know, like. You can always go with Dan and Kika. I'll just head, head up and hit Bobby White up and go and sell with him for a few. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Enjoy. Um, <laughs> um, so look, I would love to, I think that, Never say never. I mean, yeah, joking aside, we never thought that we would take our boat through the French canals. Like there's a lot that we've done that we never really planned on yep. doing. So, we'll I, you know, we have the plan and then the reality might take a completely yeah. different course. We I just want, go with the flow. And while I've got you, there's a thousand of you watching at the moment. So please, if you haven't already clicked the like, just hit the like and then subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. There we go. Next question. Should we go into the 30 second one? Oh, wow. There are. Um, yeah. Another 30 second one if we can. Um, okay, uh, will you be sailing around the Vietnam area for a break in time before heading off? Maybe. We literally don't know. But I think we Probably not discussed. Vietnam itself because we have to... We have a certain period of time to get out yeah, of the we, country. We so. can't just sail <clears throat> around Vietnam. But um, we would go straight into Thailand or Malaysia, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. Oh, God, I've... If, you ha if you've had a question that you've typed and you haven't had an answer, just type it again. Again, we have about a 1,000. Yeah, I'm just trying, trying <clears> to scroll <throat> through the questions um, now. Um, how's the sailing community in Vietnam? 
Don't know. We've had a few people that have contacted us that have um, not so much sailboats, but that, like boats up and down the coast. I mean, the, you know, the coastline is about 1,200 miles long and there's a lot going on here. It's, it is, a, they are, a, you know, a race of, of Vietnamese, are a race of people that, you know, that grew up with waterways and, 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 and living on the sea. They've got a very, very long coastline. So, yeah, it's a, a huge, um, you know, history of sailing and, and boating. So, yeah, we would happily sail here and around here. I think at the moment we're pretty just, we're very, very happy just being in Saigon and staying in Saigon. And I think, you know, we're going to be here for five, six months. So um, maybe once, you know, in a few months' time, we'll take a trip up the coast. But for now, we're just pretty, pretty happy. Yeah, for sure. Next 30 seconds. Um, next 30 seconds. Uh, will you be only filming Ruby Rose 2 or Hull Number 1 also? No, we're definitely filming Hull Number 1 as well. Um, because that's like super interesting for us and also I think for you guys to see kind of what that next stage is going to look like. So Hull Number 1 will reach certain milestones, obviously, before Hull Number 2, reach yep. all the milestones before, before Hull Number 2. So we'll be filming both. Um, I think we'll be doing three as well. I mean, three has three. still parts to be infused and there's a lot yeah. of stuff that I've... Again, Seaman was super kind in <clears throat> sending us the, the footage. But there are things that I'm like, I'd actually like to watch that myself. So I kind of, I think so between holes one, two, and three, we'll film different bits of each. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, um, are we still on for that masthead camera? Um, we haven't actually. Do you know what? One of the things that fell off the list, and again, it's no fault of anyone's. We really talked about putting cameras on the mastheads and... There were certain, we were, again, I, I don't even know who we were talking to. It's it's so long ago. So, uh, yes, if there is someone that sells masthead cameras, let, get in touch with us. That's, I think, that's <laughs> best way to So someone that supplies masthead cameras, we would love to have. It's probably something we could fit, like, well, we, we could, could retrofit. Yeah, but yes and no. I think the, the whole if thing about this is there's a conduit that goes inside the mast for taking the, the cabling. And really, it is best practice to get that cabling, get that done while the mast is down. So yeah, I, I wouldn't want to try and retrofit that um, any other way. So yeah, I, so yeah, so I think if there is any any company that does these, just let us know, and we'll, we'll we'll try and get something sorted out there. Richard, what is the largest sea wind hull built in Vietnam? Currently, the sixteen hundred, which is fifty two foot. Doug, what uh, have you decided on mast configuration and sails? Yes. So um, the mast, when you say configuration, we're going for an aluminium mask. I think the insurance for carbon is just astronomical. So we're going for aluminium <clears throat> and also long, wear and tear over weight. Sails, yes, um, we are going for GPL light skin sails from Doyle, which are carbon sails. They are um, going to give us about a knot of extra speed. And then a code zero, again, we're going for a high performance code zero it's a um, performance laminate and then a asymmetric which we are just finishing the design for the graphic for so um that's actually a little bit of news we've got for you i guess we need to mention that as well so yes yeah, so um the sail wardrobe um gpl light skin they're dark gray stroke black sails for the main and the the genoa jib stroke and then uh code zero asymmetric a uh, big thing, thanks to um, Lise um, Jorgensen. Thank you, Lise. That's really... Do you have a question, Lise, so we can answer these? Yeah, if you have a question, let us know. You just let us know. Um, um, no, next. Uh, Richard, are you guys engaged? Did I miss something? Yeah, we, we've been engaged for two years. Um, yeah. Two long years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting married this year. Um, what? N nothing. Uh the sober sailor says, um, <laughs> "Get out!" <laughs> no, that's a terrible thing to say. I don't mean that. Um, Rapido Trimaran is in Vietnam. Do you think you could visit the facility? We are <clears throat> actually one of our things on the list this week is to contact uh, Triac and ask if they will let us visit. So yeah, we will. We're, we, we're going to be in touch with them. Hopefully. We are going to yeah because they've got all the five axis milling, and if they are happy to, we would love to film that. So yes, that's on our list of things to do. Yeah. Would it be possible to see when to deliver the boat on its hull to another country? They deliver the finished boats all the time to everywhere in the world. So is, is, is that person asking 
as in a partially completed book? I don't know. I just, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't think, no, they would complete the boat here and then ship the completed boat yep. elsewhere. And then that the boat would be commissioned wherever yes. it was that it was, you know, shipped to by a local broker or, you know, a sea wind representative of some description. Um, Richard, where did the name Ruby Rose come from? As a thousand people chime in. It is um, <laughs> Ruby was my grandmother's name and Rose was Teresa's grandmother's name. There you go. Excellent. Easy question. Um, Squaloogle. Thank you, mate. That's right. Is that a question that says beers, beers, just, beers? Just beers, beers, beers. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. It's the answer to that. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, questions. Um, did COVID delay the wedding? Yes, yes. by two years. By two years. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, yeah, just while Teresa's firing up the other questions, one thing that is going to happen and some news for you all in, um, in about two weeks, I think, we are changing some of our branding. This is all like in the pipeline. There's new merchandise, new logos, new everything coming out. We kind of are going to keep the old logo for kind of some of the work t-shirts because I always like the, I like the, the current logo, but we're going to change it for Rose too. So you will see a change of... Um, yeah, the branding all to be announced yeah yeah it's it's, it's, it's a good one it's, it is a good one um dan what brand of chart potters does see when news uh bng we will be having bng tt what will the motors be did you consider electric we've been uh, asked this question so many times yes the motors are going to be 57 horsepower yamars the so 5j3 yeah the 57s 4jh whatever mm -hmm. um it's 57 horsepower we literally last week um we're going to film that we want to film the installation of the of the of the motors engine sorry the whole thing about this is that i'm going to do a whole technical spec on torque curves and how fuel economy changes when you move from the standard 39 to the 57 and how you know why we've gone for 57 because it's about for us about range about better fuel economy about less noise only running one engine and yeah so that's that's coming up to be watched sorry did you say why we didn't go for electric there is nothing on the market that provides what we want at the moment mm. that for what we want that doesn't mean to say it can't be done i think the whole thing about the the jimmy uh jimmy corner you know with these electric Uchimer, i think the this is just my take on it. And I know that, you know, for every opinion, there's a counter opinion. I don't like gen sets. I really, I've never liked gen sets. I consider the whole need necessity for a gen set in 2022 in boating to just be, it's, it's a pointless exercise. I think to me, it's moving the same way as <clears throat> SSB radios. It's almost outdated technology because solar lithium batteries mean that you can efficiently run a boat with solar and or renewables like wind or hydro generators um, without the need for bloody great gen set. So that's my take on it. They're also clunky, expensive, and, and I've said this a hundred times before, more often than not, when we see anyone, any liverboard cruiser fixing their boat, they're always fixing the gen set because it always breaks down. So they are, they tend to, we have found from talking to friends, be unreliable or less reliable than other things. So the whole thing about the Jimmy Cornell electric Uchimer, Uchimer definitely said to them, you need a gen set, and he didn't want a gen set. Um, so hence the range. And the thing is now that if you want electric motors, you really are going to have to think about seriously putting a gen set in. But that to me gives you just a weak, you're still burning diesel. And it gives you a, a weak, you know, a weak point in the whole chain. So, mm. yeah. Uh, Victor, um, thank you very much, Victor. That's very generous. Um, that's a lovely comment as well. So thank you. What did much. he say? He said, um, I've been following Sidey channels on YouTube. Yours is the best ever. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, who else? Uh, another question. I just read somewhere about how the conditions needed to make the most of a code zero are hardly seen in the open ocean. Um, I think you're probably right. Yeah. I think you are probably right. <clears throat> I think that um, code zeros have um, an effective wind angle that they need to adopt. I think that the flat cut of the cut of the side, because for those of you who aren't, you know, into you know, 
at, at that far on your journey with sailing. Code zero is a, a pretty flat cut and therefore they work best upwind. And we, when you're ocean sailing, tend to be downwind sailing. And also, you know, when you're downwind sailing, you're going to want an asymmetric sailing, which is full of cut. Like, you know, the example is like code zero looks like an airplane wing asymmetric like a big pair of baggy knickers to kind of take the you know to blow everything down with so there are specific conditions that you need um to have to, to fly a code zero what offsets that for accessibility and usability is that in many cases you can because code zero is full you put you can keep them furled and where you where the conditions are right you just unfold the sail and off you go so I think that they are easier to use and on catamarans where light air performance is so critical, um, you are going to need one. So, but from our experience, I mean, if you ever watch our video, the day we left Bermuda mm. to sail across the Atlantic to return, like we did that under code zero and we just absolutely, it was one of those days where the conditions were right, but having yeah. sailed Ruby Rose for seven years, you are correct that, the the, the 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 conditions required to fly a code zero are not as prevalent as you would maybe think that being said it was our favorite sail mostly because when we had it out the conditions were like really yeah, you know, and, yeah that, the light there were light winds and the conditions were really lovely I'm so. another glass of water just answer the next question on okay. your own oh okay um my question eric is um are you equipping ruby rose 2 with sonar yes we are and now Oh, Sam, stop. That's so lovely of you. I appreciate that. Thank you, mate. Um, okay. Yeah, May is um, the current date for um, completion of Ruby Rose 2. And uh, ideally, we would, well, we'd, we've, as we've said, we don't know whether we'll launch the boat here in Vietnam or whether we'll ship and launch um, elsewhere in the world. So that is to be determined depending very much on costs and timings and logistics. Yep. Um, we won't know that until much closer closer to the date. Um, okay. <clears throat> if we haven't answered your question so far and you've got something that's, like, really burning, um, please ask, ask it again yep. now um, because, yeah, the chat – I don't know if you guys are aware of this because you're probably not scrolling back to look at previous comments, but when you're trying to scroll, scroll back – um, on the chat, like in the chat thing, is kind of every now and again it just skips to the most recent comment, and uh, then I lose. Yeah, it's not it's not us being rude. <clears throat> no, no. Someone's asked about top speed for Ruby Rose too. Um, that's it. At the moment, we've just got a theoretical based on the polar diagrams. They're talking about nineteen knots now. Um, nineteen knots, I think, theoretical. It's all to do with boat weight and sea state and other bits and bobs. I would be surprised if we can't comfortably cruise at 10 knots. That's that's what I've got there. And that's based on the thing about the, the hull design of this boat. By making it, the whole boat slightly wider, by making the hull slightly wider with a flatter bottom, it's not as sensitive to, to weight loading as, a, as the, maybe a boat that was designed with a slightly different hull from a slightly older mentality. The best way I can describe this is that, you know, just um, pressure being uh, force over area. So if you have a triangle shape, which is kind of conventional hull shape, and you load it, you put more pressure there because there's a smaller area, so you have a greater force, so it pushes down. If you have a flatter hull like that, <laughs> it's flatter, when you push down, it doesn't sink, so you don't increase wetted area, which means that you don't increase drag. So we are confident that achieving 10, notes, 10 knots of average cruising speed should be pretty easy with this. Um, a channel called What's Dave Up To um, says, have you considered one of those wing type spinnakers that are vented and inflate like a winged parachute? We had one. We had Parasailer a, on Ruby Rose. We had they're, a parasailer. they're great. And there's also, there's another company that do them called, I think a wing. Yeah. The reason we are not having a parasail on, and we loved our parasail on Ruby Rose at this Ruby Rose 2 isn't really a cruising boat. She's more a performance cruiser. And as such, we will sail the boat differently. Um, by example, 
crossing the Atlantic, it's a downwind sail. And we tend to be with Ruby Rose, literally with the parasail, you can run just dead downwind, literally 180 degrees, set the sail, drop the main. So it's parasail is meant to only be used as a standalone sail with the main dropped. And it's pretty monkey proof. You literally raise the sail and off you go downwind. And the boat wallows and what the principle is that the parachute part at the front um, creates lift, so it stops the stern coming, the, the stern raising. It also allows gusts to pass through. And with that parasailer, you literally just let the boat go. And there are some caveats to this. With a parasailer, you do have to make sure that your spinnaker halyard or the halyard you're flying yourself from is very, very, very well articulated. Uh, we found this out the hard way. Um, because essentially the spinnaker or the, the parasailer, it moves around. It kind of floats around and chaffs through. It cha I mean, I was chaffed through. And, you know, when we, before we set up across the Atlantic, the guy from parasailer turned up, this German guy called Thomas, and he's like, nine, 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 mm -hmm. you've got this all set up wrong. You'll chew through your spinnaker halyard in like 10 seconds. So we went and re-rigged the whole thing as per his instruction, and we still chewed through it. So that's the way that parasailers work. They are meant to be pretty easy, but the playoff against that is you lose performance and but you do get to go downwind. With a performance boat, you are really working on VMGs. Your velocity made good. So you are, rather than going dead downwind, which is not the most efficient point of sail, you are going to be zigzagging down the rum line. You're going to be jibing all the way down, which basically means that you're making you know turns as you kind of cross a, an ocean. But because you can go so much faster, because you know you are a more efficient point of sail, you actually get between point A, which is your start, and point B, which is your destination, faster. So it's not about how short the distance is. It's about how quickly you can get there. And as anyone who's sailed a boat will attest to, you know, getting from A to B is never about going straight from point A to point B. It's about you know jibing or tacking your way to that point as efficiently as possible yeah it will be a learning experience for us because we've never cruised that way before obviously when you're racing that's something that you're <clears> thinking about <throat> yeah but we've we've always just done um the easiest option which yep. is usually just sailing the rum line so um it's going to be a different way of of crossing an ocean and we're excited and we're looking forward to the challenge but yep. it's going to be Definitely a learning experience. Well, just I want to add a few things to that about the sails because I think obviously the sailing boat and um, <clears throat> with that sound like um, Forrest Gump, I have a lot to say on this matter. Okay, well. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it quiet. I'll just, I'll just Number one, um, we have, we're working with Doyle sails to make the sails, but they have designed the boat with sea wind to have an optimum VMG. Now, the, uh, sorry, an optimum sail angle. Now, the optimum sail angle for this boat is, is, is not, the wind at 90% apparent, 90 degrees, sorry, 90 degrees apparent. So you are going to be sailing, jibing a lot. That's the first thing. Second thing, and I picked this up with Shane, about preventers, because I'm like, well, hang on a second. You know, if we've got to do all these jibes at speed, that increases the risks of accidental jibe. And how do we work with that to stop us from, like, you know, causing problems? And what Seawind are doing, which really put my mind at rest, is they're building preventers into the coach roof. So you can actually, you will have permanently rigged preventers for downwind sailing, which is great. Yeah, um, that will make life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, well, what is your choice of tender and what size outboard? This was one of the things that we did decide when we were um, sailing in Australia because it was something that we, we'd we been tossing up between getting like the bigger tender or like which was heavier or the smaller one, which was obviously lighter. Um, and we ended up going for the smaller, lighter option because we just realised that weight saving was more important to us. So what did we end up going oh, with? Oh, well, hang on a second. We're going with a 340 high field yeah. with the centre console because only 30 kilos and a 20 horsepower um, uh, outboard. A couple of points. Having lived on board for so long, an electric start is an absolute must. Like, honestly, because it gets to the point where they all, you know, you need an electric start because doing this all, you know, when the engine won't start, you end up putting your back out. Um, the center console for 30 kilos, it changes the position that you're, that you're in when you're actually driving the boat and driving the tender and thus makes it easier. So I think it's a 340 high field, um, with, um, a 20 horsepower 
electric start and center console. Yeah. Also, and this is not our, I wish I wish I thought this up. I wish I thought this up. But someone, someone, I think one of our patrons came up with this the other day. The dinghy two, Ruby Rose two is going to be called what? I don't know. We've never named our tender before. Okay, well, this is this. this. What would the dinghy two? And there's a, there's a hint in the fact I'm not calling it tender. Yeah, two. yeah. What would the dinghy two, Ruby Rose two, be called? Ruby dinghy? No. Dinghy Ruby? No. Dinghy dongy. <laughs> Dingy Dongy. There you go. That's the best you can come up with. Dingy Dongy. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Why what, do you keep saying the word dingy? Okay. Well, okay. What? Uh, uh. What is what? What is the uh, what is the acronym we're going to use for Ruby Rose Two? RR Two. Yeah. Dingy Two. RD Two. RR Two D Two. Brilliant, no? I thought that was clever. Anyway, so the the, the the Star Wars nerd in me. So yes, it's going to be the dingy will be called RR Two D Two. That is a mouthful, and I'm not calling my dinghies on it with takes me like a mouthful. In it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we are live. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, okay, so moving very swiftly along, what will the top speed of Ruby Rose 2 be? I think, as I said, for the Polar's 19 knots, um, we'll see. That's, <laughs> I think, no, I, I don't think there's any reason to assume that the Polar's will, will, will lie, and we're only very, very, very mindful of the weight, yeah, that we actually load this boat down with. You know, we do um we did overload ruby rose as a monohull not as sensitive to weight loading mm. um but i think with you know we will definitely you know top speed should be up there but it's not about top speed it's about sustained cruising performance and really that to us is far more important being able to say comfortably having covered you know numerous sea miles in numerous sea states we can cruise effectively at, and I would like to think 10 knots um, is, is achievable. Very achievable. Yeah. Um, Jean-Michel uh, says, I was pleased to see a Ruby Rose package available for the 1370. I'll pick it with my eyes closed. Yes, more to come on that. Uh, we Basically, the Ruby, Rose, the Ruby Rose pack is essentially a, um, a just a, they're standard features that you just click on a box and it puts things in, but it's like lithium batteries and other bits that honestly, like we think, you can. You, this is really what you should be putting into a boat. It's not like, you know, it's not going to be, he's not going to have a picture of my face on it or anything. It's nothing branded. It is simply. It's, it's essentially our boat, the specifications that we've put on our some boat. Of, some of them. It's not all of the specs. It's 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 a certain number of specs that we've yeah. chosen. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, who's that? Doug. 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 Thank you, Doug. Doug Crombie. Crombie. Thank you. Does that a question? Is No, it just says. Nick can't read because he doesn't have his glasses on. <laughs> hey, <dog. laughs> um, it's good that you guys are foodies. I would starve in Vietnam or find some granola. Granola. You wouldn't because literally, well, in Ho Chi Minh at least, there is every food that you could possibly want. Whatever you like to eat, you'll be able to I find. I actually it here. found Marmite peanut butter yesterday. Yeah, you'd be able to find anything here. Anything. Anyway, next question. Um are we saying the Tao Dien district is like on? Yes, yes. we are. It's and awesome. love it. Absolutely love it here. Yeah, it's really nice. We are house sitting ends um, next week, um, and we're very grateful to our friend for letting us stay. But we will take. A, we will find another apartment in Tao Dien. Hopefully. Um, induction. We were talking about this yesterday. Are we having an induction cooker or a gas? Stove? I think. I think we're having both actually now. I feel like that's a very complicated way of doing things. No, it's a perfectly accessible way of doing things. If they, I, think, I think that was the last thing. Anyway, next. We don't, to be confirmed, ongoing conversations about that. We want induction. Anyway. Uh, Victor, I have three young kids. Thank you, Victor. That's incredibly generous of you, Victor. Thank you very much. Um, the question is, I have three young kids and maybe the best I can hope for is three to four days in Huraki, Gulf, or slightly further similar conditions to Tasman seas uh I don't know where that is mate um I heard I know you've got some experience with the 1260 would you recommend this boat to New Zealand condi oh okay so I'm assuming that's in New Zealand right would you recommend this boat to New Zealand conditions um for sure so are you saying that you would be sailing in New Zealand on with your three kids um and would the 1260 be a good option Absolutely. I think the 1260 will be a great option for sailing around yeah. New Zealand. Yeah, she, um, the, the, it's a very, very strong boat. And yeah, I think uh, so we had two, we, we had chartered two last year. I think one that I would say is the second one, Pirate Pete, um, that had been in charter for a while. Um, 
I want to say a while, maybe three years. I mean, it peaked, peaked. I think it was the second or third season. Yeah. yeah. But it, there are no squeaks, no breaks. And I think that really is, you know, things get absolutely hammered in charter. I've seen, you know, uh, charter boats that are less than a couple of seasons old that are just wrecked. So I think they, so I think as a, as a, to a testament to their toughness, they, they survived charter well. So yeah, I think, I think you'd be in a good position. And the other thing is I, you know, from the point of view of New Zealand, when we chartered the first boat in Sydney, the weather wasn't always good. No. So it was easy to keep warm and dry. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, <clears throat> we've said this before, the 1260 I think is a great, great option um, for kind of coastal cruising, island hopping, that kind of thing. Um, it would be probably really good in New Zealand because we found, as Nick said, like we kind of sailed in lots of different weather conditions and we cruise in lots of different weather conditions in Australia on the 1260 and it was just as good in kind of cooler, rainier conditions yeah. as it was in, in warmer conditions. Um, so I think it would be a great option for New Zealand. What's that little question in yellow, mate? Uh, that is, why can't I see who that's from? This guy. Oh, from Mike. Mike. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you for all you do um, to keep us informed. Um, wish you the best of luck. Thank you. It's like getting a birthday card from a, 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 from a, from a favourite uncle. <laughs> Wishing you all the best for your 15th birthday. <laughs> Love from Uncle Pete. Um, okay. What is, this is a good question. What are, what is the most important spare parts you will carry? We carried all the spare parts on Ruby Rose and it was too much. Okay. So I think there's a couple of differences here between. I'm just going to answer. Yeah. Uh, can, can, uh, Trish, can you bring me some more of them? Do you want me to scratch The important thing about. The obvious difference between a catamaran and um, monohull is that you've got two engines. And most of the spares that we carried were probably bought out of naivety um, and inexperience. Things like spare alternator, which stayed in its box on the day we bought it to the day we sold the boat. Spare starter for the same reason. Because my worry was, well, what if we get caught somewhere and we can't start the boat? Or, uh, you know, I read a horror story where they couldn't start the engine, therefore they couldn't raise the anchor. When you've got a spare engine, you've literally got all those parts. Um, however, you know, there are obviously conditions where you could disable both engines at once. And one of those things would probably be uh, uh, tainted fuel or water in the fuel. So as with everything, we will be looking very hard to keeping spares of um, consumables like filters, oil filters, fuel filters, impellers. Those things are a must. Um and we will have to carry double of all those. So um, someone asked, um, those will be the spares. I think in our Facebook group um, yesterday, someone asked about carrying a spare autopilot. I don't think we need to carry a spare autopilot at the moment. I think that there is enough data now about the hydraulic autopilots um, to, um, for us to not worry about um, needing a redundant one. Because um, the reliability is so much higher. However, we promised our patrons that we would take one or two or more of them across oceans. Um, as as, as a, just a so as, at some point, you know, when we cross oceans, we will have crew, and having crew means that even if your autopilot breaks and you've got a crew of four or five, you can you can. Hands we there. can just get our patrons to hand steer us across the ocean. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> Who needs a spare autopilot? <laughs> but, 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 yeah, patrons aside, you know, I think so that, that could be taken the wrong way. Yeah, no. We would always – that's one thing about having additional crew is that yeah. you, can, you can hand steer for, you know. Longer. Longer periods. Uh, Tyler, um, were, will the Corian countertops be foam cored? Yes. Yes, they will. And that is something that we have talked about. That Corian is an absolute must for us. Like, it is – they talk about the weight gain, but the weight, the original weight provided was based on a 12 mil Corian section. It's now down to six, which is foam called bonded, which halves the weight. And having had Ruby Rose for seven years, we know that they, it looks as good on the day that you sell the boat as the day that you bought the boat and plastic does not. So for a boat which has nine square meters of work surface visible, there is no way we were ever going to have plastic. It's like having a plastic work surface in your home. Why would you do it? Yeah, you have to stare at, stare at it every day, so you want it to look nice. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Tim, this is a question for you, Nick. When you first sail Ruby Rose 2, what will be the first song you play on the boat? 
Uh, actually, I, I probably know what it's going to be because I've got this kind of weird tradition where every time I bought a new car, I had to play the same song. It's Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Do I know that song? I'll sing it to you later <laughs> while I'm romancing you. Speaking of romancing, um, MV Mojo says, Teresa, how would the headroom be on the bed in the bed in the master bedroom? Chica boca. <laughs> wah, wah. It, it's enough. Perfectly sufficient. Thank no, you. I think we've actually we we videoed this. Yeah, we did. Well, find this careful. on our OnlyFans. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's um, we did we have because when we visited Hull One in the factory, they've already got the the. The, the the inserts for the master cabin in place so you can see exactly how much headroom you, you've got you have substantially more than you had in the 1260 yeah significantly more like yeah. a normal amount probably more than what we had in ruby rose yes um okay have you guys talked about financing ruby rose to how financing it we've talked um as much as we're willing to about financing it, I think from our point of view, we are in partnership with Seawind. We put a big post out about this because occasionally we get some cranky, you know, not followers, some that watches like, oh, hi. we had actually a post the other day, like, who's paying for this? <laughs> like, we're paying for the boat. We're not getting a free boat, but we are in partnership with Seawind and the cost of the boat reflects that. But, you know, in the same way that, you know, we don't publish many details about ourselves and similarly a thousand people that are watching this now probably don't put their social security numbers out and other personal details we don't and would never there you go um okay let's uh cut, let, yeah let, let's go to final questions um so if you if any of you have a, a burning question that we haven't answered yet then now is time to yep. time <clears> them out um, so, yeah, we're kind of at an hour and 11 minutes now, so probably time to start answering those last questions. So, yes, if we haven't answered, uh, answered your question yet, then now is the time. Uh, <laughs> suddenly a lot of questions coming through. Okay, well, let's be try to answer them all. Uh, okay. If you take possession of Rubro's 2 in Vietnam, which way will you say sell her? West. Almost invariably west. I think the plan would be to... You know, I, probably to try and see Thailand and Malaysia, hopefully catch up with um, Benita and Yoshi again. And also... Um, they're in a completely different part of Indonesia. Oh, they've gone to Indo now. Okay. Yeah, of course they have. Yeah, they have. So, yes, but probably West. It will be West. It will yeah. be, um, if we take over here, it will be, first of all, the um, Thailands and... Sorry, the Thailands. The islands in Thailand. So, Koh Samui, Koh Tao, Koh Panyam, the islands on that side. And then south to Malaysia... And some islands off the coast of Malaysia. We also want to go to the Anabas Islands in Indonesia. Um, so, yeah, what are so, you smiling at? Doug's question, which is, um, which other patrons will be sailing with me? So we've actually got, <laughs> we actually have, we've been thinking about this for two years, and it's not related to Doug and which patrons, but how we would entertain and get sailing with multiple patrons at the same time. And we've actually got, we've got a blueprint, which we intend to kind of like, put into practice as soon as we know where we're getting the boat shipped to or what we're doing with the boat in a situation where we have, um, say for instance, we do get the boat to the Caribbean. We are going to start and we're going to do an event where we try and actually get other boats involved to uh, like do like a regatta around certain parts of the Caribbean and we'll take patron sailing or, and I, you know, I think other channels have done this where we get groups of patrons to kind of fly into a place for a week and then we just do events every day. Some will and be like sailing, day, day sales, day sales or, yeah. or, or like parties on board or, yeah. and we'll just help. It, it, look, we've just got, we've got some amazing stuff planned, but obviously we can't just tell you everything because otherwise, you know, it's like opening all the doors on the advent calendar on the 1st of December, but also because we, kind of want to finalize the details but the ruby rose regatta is something that we are yeah. definitely we've, we've been planning this for a while now well covid but and covid an yeah, of course yeah so okay so mm. um let's answer okay let, let's really stick to maybe even 15 seconds if we can last few questions 15 seconds is my go-to time <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of like inappropriateness so um, in this chat but anyway that's next default so there you go um Okay, quick fire questions. Um, what is your favorite destination so far? I would say the French Canals. Yes. And oh, closely followed by Brittany yes. in France. So France. Yeah, France. Um, 
Alan, for the first time live aboard, would you recommend a cat or get experience on a mono first? Uh, it depends on your sailing ground. I think for the, if you intend to do this, I would charter both. Go and charter a mono, go and charter a cat, and then see what you think. Because honestly, what, what you will spend on chartering one of each will be a lot less than you'll pay in brokerage fees selling a boat that you're not happy with. Can you list the extras on top of the Ruby Rose pack for the 1370 at some stage? Yes, yes we definitely we, we, we will. We definitely do that. I think the whole reason we haven't, we can, as soon as we've got, now that we're in Vietnam, we can give you so much more detail. Yeah. Far, <clears throat> far too difficult to do remotely. Yeah. Um, could your new vessel be single-handed? Yes. Yes. Um, Easy. But better set up for, for double-handed, but yes, in you know, if needed. But you can say... If, if you were... Uh, if you were like a permanent single hander, then I probably would get something smaller. Um, yeah, but yeah, you can sail it. But you, you could. Yeah, I mean, look, you can sail a seventy foot boat single handed. It's docking it up that becomes a difficulty. But I think for, personally, I'd look, I'd want something smaller as a single hander. Yeah, yeah. Renee, love you guys. Um, do you think it is possible for a plastic hull for a boat like Ruby Rose to why or why not? I don't really understand the question. Most, um, most, well. Boats are plastic, uh, fiberglass. It's just the aluminium and the um, steel. Yes, yeah, so Ruby Rose is a is a fiberglass, aka plastic boat. Yeah, yeah. And most catamarans, I think every catamaran apart from there's um there's now the is it Garcia Garcia Explorer is cat, a yeah. I think aluminium yeah. hull cat. Yes. Um, Please come to the boat show in Maryland next year. We'd love to. We'll try. We'll, we'll try do our to, best. Yeah, We're not anywhere near the US at the moment, so yeah. it could be easier said than done, but we'll try. The other thing is, I think, you know, aside from boat shows, I think there's enough interest in Ruby Rose too, and this the, that we would actually just, if we're in a marina somewhere, you know, we know we're going to be somewhere in a month or so, just say, look, we're going to have the boat here, just um, we'll do our own thing, and it'll be free. Um. Michelle, are there still places you haven't sailed to that you want to go to with RR2 and RRD2? I feel like RR2D2 is is um is going to take on a life of its own, whether I like it or not. Beep, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> yes, loads. We want to. I mean, our dream, one of our many dreams, is to go to the South Pacific. Um, so I definitely want to sail <clears throat> French Polynesia. Cook Islands, Tonga, Fiji, you know, I really want to go I think, there. I point. think I've got this kind of vision in my head of kind of like the the, the gates of the Panama Canal opening and letting us and out. And the, the Pacific, Pacific yeah. opening and up before point, us. Like, yeah. That would be like a real moment. I'll be smoking a cigar like they did in the A team and doing my <laughs> Hannibal impression. <clears throat> what country do you plan to register the boat? Brit uh, UK. Yeah. Um, Squalugal. Uh, thank you. Are you prepared for lightning strikes regarding mm -hmm. your electronics? Yes. If it happens, it happens. Nothing we can do about it. We'll just have to get, get the old sextant out. But we'll just have to get our patrons out to... Uh, <laughs> yes, well, we've got the order pilot. <laughs> we'll send them a, a message in a box. To <laughs> send help. <laughs> <laughs> send snacks. <laughs> um, okay. When will your boat be ready? In May, we hope and we think. Um what Vietnamese street food have you guys tried and which is your favourite so far? Yeah, so we are making our way surely, um, yeah, steadily and surely through Vietnamese street food. Vietnamese, um, we found a really good place in District 4 which just does seafood, and, seafood. so chilli crab yeah. and clams but and we've beer. Had... And, like, honestly, like, for us to sit down and eat, like, a whole chilli crab and then plate of clams and then noodles and then beers, and it's about $7. One thing I did not so know is cheap. that... At least in Ho Chi Minh, like maybe it just maybe it's just a South Vietnam thing. I'm not sure, but um, like seafood is actually actually like a huge part of their the like cuisine. And I, yeah, I know, but you, you have Vietnamese in like Australia and in the UK, and you know seafood does not feature anyway. Uh, so um, it's not all fur. No, but we've eaten lots of fur, and we've eaten banh mi, of course, and um, bun cha, and bun ma, bun cha, bun cha. Yeah, bun um, cha. Although that's a northern Vietnamese dish. Um, and one thing that we haven't had yet that I'm really desperate to is I think that it's called ban zao, ban zao. They're ban like zao. the pan, the pancakes. Mm -hmm. I really want to try those. Okay. All right. I think that we're done. Um, what do you do? So listen, a couple of things. If you haven't, if you've if you've tuned in and you have seen us and you've enjoyed this, please click the like button because um, kind of like yeah, it's good for us. One if last question. That's a good one, Ashley. This is an obvious question that I forgot. Yes. Some people don't understand. Um, why don't you sail across the Pacific 
to the US from Vietnam uh, and visiting Fiji on the way. Yeah. So this is the great irony of like the whole situation is that we really want to get to the Pacific and it's like our number one destination and we're closer to the Pacific than we've ever been on our boat before, um, i.e. in Vietnam. The Pacific's like right there. And we can't get there because of the prevailing winds. So it's but you all, can, but it's, just, it's an absolute shenanigan to it, get it. Mm, you would literally have to go far north, like you'd have to sell up north to Japan, cross like far north Atlantic, like Russia level, Alaska, um, and then come back down the US west coast and no. then cross the Pacific again in the other direction. Not going to happen. All right. Anyway, so listen, okay. um, I think we're about done. Um, yeah, hit that, hit the, hit the, yep, yep, the thumbs up, hit the like. Um, we have got lots more videos coming out. So if you haven't already subscribed, as I said at the beginning of this feed, a lot of you are telling us that you've had your um, subscriptions turned off. I mean, and it does, and the notification box gets turned off as well. That's why we not quite sure. So yeah, so we, time. the time that yeah, we keep saying, oh, hit the notification bell, hit the subscribe button because a lot of you have subscribed and found yourself unsubscribed. Anyway, it's Sunday lunchtime here. We are going to be, the new video comes out in two days' time. We've got a lot of really, really cool stuff to show you. We will be filming weekly in the factory in Ho Chi Minh. There's lots of really cool stuff um, from both factories. Um, I've got, I'm going to go into real nerd detail on a lot of stuff in the next month or so. The way that the engines, that's a couple of things. Firstly, the way the engines, uh, engine talks, engine installation, I've got a whole thing about the furniture construction um, and other bits and bobs. So there's going to be a lot of that stuff coming up. Um, and then obviously you'll see the build just work, you know, the whole way the build works. And we're very, very, very excited about that. And then obviously, you know, by the time hopefully May, June comes about, we'll be test sailing at least the first hull, then taking delivery of our own boat by summer, then sailing her somewhere in the world. So we've got a whole a amount of stuff. Year. And then... Sailing her in uh, autumn, winter, getting married, then crossing an ocean. There you go. That's 2022. We have to catch up for 2020 and 2019 and 2021. So listen. Yeah, we have to um, make up for lost time. I hope you've enjoyed this live stream. Um, we will see you all real soon. For those of you who have been messaging us on the WhatsApp group, please feel free to continue the messages. Um, we will try and answer all your questions on WhatsApp. Um, so, so thanks to the patrons for that. And again, like lots of opportunities coming up for sailing with Ruby Rose 2. There's going to be the announcement of the new logo very over the next week or so. New merchandise that's new, that's coming up. And it's all happening. It's all here. It's going to be very, very busy. But thank you. We genuinely could not do this without you um, because, you know, you, you are what make our channel. Otherwise, we'd just be sitting here talking to ourselves about this, which would be weird. And so we've been sitting here talking to over 1,100 people, which is mad. So thank you so much, all of you. Um, like, Stay safe, enjoy yourselves, look after yourselves, and we'll do another live feed probably next month. Take care. See you guys. Goodbye. Bye.